Hello, Shades here. And yes, these are women's shades. Unfortunately, I'm running out of new shades for these videos, but hopefully more shades are on the way. Now, before we go any further, I would like to wish my uh, 47 subscribers and anybody who's watching this a very merry Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa. Basically, whatever you celebrate, if you celebrate, I hope you've had an amazing day filled with love and laughter. Now, moving on, what could be more appropriate on such a day than uh, making a video on chaos? Chaos, that great evil that infests the world of Warhammer Fantasy. So, in Warhammer Fantasy lore, we have two dimensions. Two worlds separated from each other by a thin veil. There's the physical Warhammer world, with its trees, mountains and rivers, populated by many animals and the intelligent races, men, elves, dwarves, etc. However, separated from this world by a thin veil of reality, and existing parallel to it, in what can only really be described as another dimension, is what is known as the Realm of Chaos. Now, in the beginning, before the coming of the Old Ones and the creation of the intelligent races, the Realm of Chaos was a quiet place, a vast expanse of nothingness, a realm filled only with an energy. This energy is called, naturally, Chaos Energy, and it saturates the realm of chaos, much in the same way as air fills our own world. Now, chaos energy has many different properties, many of which will become apparent in the rest of this video. However, the first thing to talk about is the way in which this chaos energy has a deep-rooted connection with the living creatures of the Warhammer world, and how it changes and mutates in relation to them. A preemptive warning, this is all going to sound very weird and abstract, but the nature of chaos is probably the strangest thing in the Warhammer lore. It's also very important, being the main source of evil, so please bear with me, all will be explained. So as I said, before the creation of the intelligent races, the realm of chaos was quiet and still. However, when intelligent life did come into the picture, the chaos energy within this parallel dimension reacted to their presence, or more specifically, it reacted to their beliefs, feelings and actions. If an elf was angry, there was a ripple in the realm of chaos. Likewise, if a man was sad or a dwarf frustrated, from such thoughts came movement. The stronger the thought or event, the greater an effect on the chaos energy. I'll give you an example. A human tribesman is unhappy with the leader of his tribe. This would have a small effect on the energy. In time, he begins to really hate him. This would have a slightly greater effect. He then goes on to convince his fellow tribesmen to also hate him. Now, the more people, the more hate, and the greater this hate is represented in the movement of the chaos energy. Finally, the tribesmen have had enough, and they kill their leader. This act of murder, fueled by hatred, has an even greater effect on the chaos energy. And the same goes for any emotion any belief and any act fueled by such emotions. So this once still chaos-infused realm is now, due to all the intelligent life about and their multitude of emotions and beliefs, very busy. The energy is whirling around all over the place, clumping together in some instances and smashing apart in others. And this continues becoming stronger and stronger until, finally, something incredible happens. Deep within the realm of chaos, life was created. Let's for a moment take a gander at our own planet, 
Certain boffins believe that life began deep down at the bottom of the ocean when certain chemical reactions took place, becoming more and more complex until primitive life forms evolved from them. I've oversimplified it just a tad, but that's besides the point. Well, in much the same way, the reactions within the chaos energy eventually birthed life forms of its own. And these life forms birthed as a direct result of the impassioned beliefs and emotional actions of intelligent life in the physical Warhammer world were given the name Chaos Gods by said intelligent life. We're very lucky in that there's a fantastic novel called The Liber Chaotica that explores chaos in great detail. There's a story contained within which explores this creation idea. It's about the birth of the blood god, Corn, who I'll be talking about in great detail further on in this video. It goes as follows. And so it came to pass that these words spoke in wrath dispersed to all corners of the land, proclaiming their message and blasting all minds that heard it. Neighbour turned on neighbour, and in sudden fury, fathers dragged sons onto the street, and there murdered them. The gentle beasts of the field trampled one another, and herdsmen slew their cattle to bathe in their blood. The kings and princes of the land fell to fevered imaginings, adorning themselves with armour and weapons, and demanding a throne made from the bones of their kin. Prisoners and slaves were put to the sword, and their heads adorned the royal dais. And the kings then sent their soldiers forth into the towns and villages to harvest more skulls for the skull thrones. Every living thing they killed, all that drew breath was culled from the earth, which in turn was fired, and the walls tumbled down, so nothing could there live again. When the earth was made as mud by the lifeblood of innocence, and wild creatures roamed the deserted lands, drinking marrow from the bones of the dead, the kings and princes turned their armies outside the hollow kingdoms to wage war against each other. The armies of all the lands met in a valley blocked by four mountains to the north and four mountains to the south, and there they fell on one another with every weapon, animal and cunning machine that they commanded. The battle raged long, for as, for as fortune waxed and waned from one army to the next. For eight days and seven nights, the warriors of the lands pushed and heaved and stabbed and slew. The kings released their hunting dogs that harried and bit and gorged themselves on hot flesh. Terrible horsemen on steeds clad in steel charged again and again. The death toll was so great that the valley itself filled with blood and drowned those who fought in its depths. The soldiers in battle hungered and consumed the fallen and drank their blood to quench their thirst, while the kings themselves ate only the flesh from the heads brought to them. As the sun sank down into the lake of death for the eighth time, the battle faltered and stopped. For the bloodthirst that had driven each mortal soul forward had at last been sated. The armies could fight no more, and there came a great wailing from the valley as every soldier lifted his voice and cried out for release, for victory or for the strength to carry on. A multitude raised their shouts to a thousand empty gods, and none replied, for the true god had heard his servants cry and its answer was one of bloodlust, power, and awesome violence. From the boiling blood sea rose eight mighty creatures, each with the heads of dogs and the bodies of lions, and each one yoked with great chains of brass. They climbed forth each mountain, and behind them dragged upwards a new mountain from the sea. A mountain of bone and skulls, that reached fully ten times the height of the eight peaks around it. Upon its sight, the soldiers of the battle took new heart 
and rose again from the gore-drenched earth to praise their true lord, while the kings and princes threw themselves down in fear as they recognised the true skull throne, of which their own had been the palest imitation. And atop the very summit, the embryonic god screamed his name in a birth cry that echoed and crashed from peak to peak, and drove the cowardly mad, even as it strengthened the worthy beyond mortal effort. And the name was Carneth, our blood god, Corn. Whilst this story is considered a myth by the men of the Warhammer world, it's a good example of how the Chaos Gods are brought into being. There are, however, a multitude of Chaos Gods, and while some, and in particular the most powerful, have powerful emotions and actions attributed to them, there are many others that are brought into being through sheer belief as well. After all, the power of belief on human emotions is extremely powerful, and if enough intelligent life forms believe in a chaos entity, then that entity will come into existence. Okay, so we now have a realm of chaos that is filled with different chaos gods, some greater, many lesser, all of them very different from each other. There is one thing, however, that all chaos gods share, they're wanting of more power. So how does a Chaos God gain power? A Chaos God's power is directly related to its influence over the intelligent races. Therefore, a Chaos God, after birth, will seek to gain, both directly and indirectly, as many worshippers as possible. The more people that pray or make sacrifice to a particular Chaos God, the more powerful it becomes, and therefore, the greater its ability to gain more followers. It's a vicious cycle. There are several ways in which the Chaos Gods can influence the physical Warhammer world. However, this was not always the case. To explain, we need to go back on ourselves a little bit. Remember how I said that the Warhammer world and the realm of Chaos were separated by a veil? Well, think of this veil as a wall. And whilst this wall was up and strong, there was nothing that the Chaos Gods could do to influence the world, meaning that there was nothing they could do to gain more power. That was until those old ones, the mystical creators of life, royally screwed things up. As I talked about in my previous video on the old ones, after having made the intelligent races, the old ones basically wanted a way of travelling across the planet at great speed. To this end, they built the polar gates at the north and south poles. These gates were connected by a pathway that took the old ones out of the physical plane, travelling across this veil between worlds, or on top of the wall in this analogy, and then out the other end. This allowed them to travel from one end of the planet to the other almost instantaneously. However, something went very wrong, and just before the old ones disappeared forever, the gates blew up. This knocked a few great big holes in our wall, allowing the chaos energy to flow from the realm of chaos into the physical world, and allowing the chaos gods to influence it for the first time. As the Chaos Gods gain more power and influence, they also gain the ability to create minions of their own within the Chaos Realm, and set up kingdoms to their liking. These minions of the Chaos Gods are given the name Demons. For an example of this, let's again turn to our good friend Korn, the God of Murder. According to the Warhammer Wiki, within the Realm of Chaos, Corn sits upon a brass throne, situated atop an unimaginably tall mountain of skulls, the grisly trophies having been reaped since the first creature killed its brother in rage. Their number is beyond counting, for every moment the mountain grows taller as Corn's warriors make bloody tithes to it. Corn has charged his consort, the demon princess Valkyr the Bloody, to descend upon the battlefields with every dawn to carry the slain to his brass halls of eternal battle. 
From other literature, we are told that within Corn's realm flow rivers of blood, the blood of the slain in battle. And so it follows that each Chaos God's realm is designed to their specific attributes. The size and prominence of the realm depends upon the power the Chaos God wields, which is determined by the level of influence they have over the intelligent races residing in the physical Warhammer world. They do this indirectly through gaining worship and sacrifice, and now, thanks to the holes in that war between worlds, they can directly send demons into the world to do their bidding, as long as Chaos Energy has also seeped through and pooled in the physical Warhammer world to sustain them. I'll be discussing the effect that the Chaos Gods have had on the physical world in my next video, talking about the first great wars against Chaos, and the great heroes who managed to beat back the chaotic invasion of demons. For the rest of this video, let's talk about the nature of the Chaos Gods and their demonic minions, so that when we get to those great battles, we know exactly what we are dealing with. In the world of Warhammer Fantasy, there are good gods, such as Sigmar, the patron god of the Empire, Azurian, the chief elven god, and many, many others. There are also evil gods, such as Korn, the god of murder, the horned rat, the Skaven's god, and again, many others. The Chaos Gods are believed by the population of the Warhammer world to only be the evil variety, with the good gods residing somewhere other than the realm of Chaos. This, however, is probably not the case. As we have just explored, when the Chaos energy within the realm of Chaos forms itself into life, that life is as a result of the population's beliefs. And so if a large group of people, say the humans of the Empire, believe that their founder, Sigmar, is now a god, the Chaos energy has the ability to make it so. There is no proof of this within the literature However, it would seem to make sense that within the realm of chaos reside all the supernatural entities, both good and bad. For the rest of this video, however, let's put ourselves in the mindset of someone within the Warhammer world and explore their concept of chaos gods, basically the evil ones. I will explore the uh, gods of the other races, men, elves, etc., in their own videos, but for now, let's deal with the nasty ones. There are many, many Chaos Gods, yet when it comes to the most powerful and prominent, there are four that take centre stage. We have Slanesh, the god of pleasure, Nurgle, the god of pestilence and plague, Zinch, the god of change, and the most powerful of all, our old buddy, Corn, the blood god. Let's take each of these gods separately and explore their look, nature, realm, minions, and impact upon the physical Warhammer world. Starting off with Slanesh, the Prince of Pleasure, and my favourite of the bunch. Slanesh is known as the God of Pleasure, which on the surface sounds like a rather good thing. However, the pleasure which Slanesh offers is a sadistic, jealous, and all-consuming one, taking complete control over the worshipper and eventually consuming them. For example, take a drug like heroin. This drug gives great pleasure to the user. However, it also takes complete control of the user, who needs more and more of it as time goes on, and who will sacrifice anything that they have and do terrible things, losing their humanity for the pleasure that they seek. Another example would be sex. Sex can be great. However, for a worshipper of Slanesh, one who seeks ever greater pleasure, the normal act of sex will soon be not enough to satisfy them 
and they will do ever more violent and degrading things in order to satiate their lust, whether their partner or partners want to or not. I hope you can see from these examples that the pleasure offered by Slanesh is an evil, an evil that may be less obvious or take more time to expose itself than the other chaos gods, but an evil nonetheless. As with Korn previously, there is a myth within the Liber Chaotica that describes these concepts excellently and gives a good description of the look and nature of this particular chaos god. I saw the ether's gate swing wide, and a great voice like the roaring of the ocean resounded across the heavens. Let all lands rejoice, for the last and most beautiful is born. Hail to the Prince of Delight, all praise to the Lord of Pleasure. Then a figure appeared at the gate, tall as the highest mountain and graceful as coiling mist. Both man and woman was he, and neither of these as well. Wrapped in a cloud of purest white, with six stars upon his brow, his coronet and mark of his glory. All beauty was he, and all desire was his name, and the multitudes gathered there fell silent at the sight of him. When he spoke, his words were as honey across my soul, for as the rising sun brings the coldness of night to its end, so I have come to bring an end to toil and bitterness. Let every land set aside their wrath and despair, and release the empty promises of change, for I am the joy of now and the vindication of life. I will love you as no other has or ever will, and you shall love me in turn, with your bodies, with your minds, and with your souls. I shall be your wife and your husband, your mistress and your lover, and in my arms you will find purpose and delight. Pleasure beyond, beyond all imagining is mine to bestow, if only you take me into your hearts. At these words, two in every three of the multitude gathered there prostrated themselves at his feet, praising him as their one true Lord, adoring him as they had no other before. The Prince of Delight smiled upon them and took their souls into his embrace. Ten thousand times ten thousand and kissed them each and every one. In single file they slid between his perfect lips that stretched from horizon to horizon and the Prince of Delight supped of them all even as they cried out in joyful gratitude. Then... Turning to the throng that had not thrown themselves at his feet, the Prince of Delight said, Through the souls of your brothers and sisters, I take my place as a fourth amongst the three. Through their pleasure, I ascend my throne. And then the Prince set amongst the stars a throne that rippled and shone like finest satin, and there he reclined to give his commandments. Raise buildings and sing songs to my glory. In my name, pursue your arts and enshrine all beauty. Let all people follow their every desire, sate their every hunger, and deny themselves no adventure. For it is in these things and in each other that you will find the greatest pleasure. And it is through these things and through each other that you shall raise yourselves high even onto the steps of my throne. Then a cloud passed over the face of the sun, and the prince spoke again, his voice both syrup and poison. You will take pleasure in all that is, though your bodies will break and your souls be forfeit. You will do this and do this gladly, for I am Slanesh, most jealous of gods, most demanding of lovers, and my thirst for you shall never be sated. 
And so we can see that to the human eye, Slaanesh would appear as an incredibly beautiful being, inspiring overwhelming lust and devotion on the beholder. In fact, in the novel Sigvald by Darius Hinks, Sigvald the Magnificent, chosen champion of Slaanesh, enters the realm of chaos and meets an aspect of Slaanesh himself. And when Sigvald asks who he is, the god replies, I am whoever you want me to be. We can learn from this that Slaanesh is the most beautiful image that the beholder can imagine, changing based on the beholder in question. Likewise, his realm would be the most luxurious, decadent, pleasure-inducing place that the beholder can imagine. Slaanesh is a very subjective deity that gives true meaning to the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I was next going to talk about the demons associated with Slaanesh. However, there's so much to talk about. You've got the many different lower demons, and then the named greater demons, with each one having a story behind it. As this video is already getting pretty darn long, and I've got three more Chaos Gods to cover, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my next video on the subject of the minions of Chaos, both demonic and the uh, followers that exist within the physical Warhammer world. And then the video after that will start on the Great War Against Chaos. Otherwise, I fear this video could go on for hours. So let's move swiftly on to the second Chaos God, Nurgle, God of Plague and Decay. Illness, infection, disease, plague, decay, rot. All these inflictions are Nurgle's business. He is the cause, and the more that they spread, the more powerful Nurgle becomes. He is often described as a great, great giant green blob of a creature, his mottled skin covered in every disease imaginable. Next to him sits a large cauldron in which Grandfather Nurgle cooks up whatever new infection he plans to unleash upon the mortal world. I say Grandfather Nurgle, as strangely, Nurgle is thought of as a rather kindly figure, among his followers at least, who view their infections as gifts designed to make them stronger. You see, despite the sores and the pus, Nurgle takes great care of his infected children, taking away their pain and stopping them from succumbing to death. Nurgle has many different disgusting demons under his control, however they can wait till the next video to spread their corruption. Nurgle's realm is famous for its great garden, where plants containing every pox and affliction are cultivated with great care and affection. Millions of flies in great swarms sweep through this garden and around Nurgle's mansion where every inch of timber is rotting and succumbing to decay. Naturally, once again, the Liber Chaotica has a brilliant description of the old grandfather. He is described here from the point of view of a priest of Sigmar. Although I am sure that all sane people would wish it otherwise, the four great powers of chaos are known throughout every kingdom and every culture in the world. But of this unholy quartet, by far the most horrific and disgusting is the deity that we, the good people of Sigmar's empire, know as Nurgle. There is nothing redeeming about this most foul of the Aether's entities, so entirely offensive is his aspect. Known also as Nirgal, Omogal, Neil Glen, and so many other monikers, Nurgle is the supreme god of decay, the fountain and architect of all rot, be it physical, moral, ideological, economic, or political. 
It is the general view of my priesthood, and indeed most of the other wholesome cults and sects throughout our beloved empire, that directly or indirectly, Nurgle is responsible for all the greatest plagues and famines that have beset our lands throughout the centuries. For, it is said, the sorrow of lepers and the fears of the sick are his greatest fascinations and truest love. Surely it is for his own amusement and nothing else that he devises the foul contagions that he inflicts upon the world. It is said that when Nurgle manifests himself to his servants, he is seen as a body racked with all manner of diseases and corruption. It appears that Nurgle's entire purpose is to promote endless suffering and misery throughout all the mortal realms. Yet, conversely to this, I have heard tell that Nurgle is supposedly deeply caring towards his mortal and demonic servants and is full of unexpected humour. Though I can scarce give this notion any credence, just how and why a chaos god, not least one that presides over decay and misery, is supposed to possess these benign characteristics is as yet beyond me. But it is my intention to examine all such claims as I proceed with this, my investigation. I'm going to have to talk rather quietly for a little bit as I'm recording this part of the video very late and everyone in the house is asleep. But I want to press on as this video is taking way too long to produce as it is. The uh, sacrifices I make for you guys, eh? LOL. Now, our next Chaos God is Zinch, also known as the Changer of the Ways and occasionally referred to as the Raven God. Now, Zinch is a very complex Chaos God. He has dominion over change, any kind of change. This can be harmless, such as a change in the weather or a new sprog in the family. However, it can also be incredibly dangerous such as the change brought when a mortal undergoes a mutation, or the change from peacetime to a world of war, the nature of warfare then naturally bringing about more changes within itself. At a fundamental level, Zinch wants a world in chaos, where constant change crumbles societies. Zinch detests the status quo, and a quiet, satisfied world. Lucky for the changer of the ways, this is the Warhammer world. A world where, as it says on the first page of practically every Black Library novel, this is a dark age, a bloody age. It is an age of battle and death. And so you can begin to see just why Zeech is so powerful. I should also quickly mention that Zinch is also thought of as a god of magic. Now, magic is an incredibly important aspect of the Warhammer world and is far too big a topic to explore in this video. We'll revisit this idea in a later video based solely on magic in Warhammer fantasy. Zinch, more than any other chaos god, truly represents the nature of chaos. After all, the pure chaos energy is all about causing change and mutation to whatever it comes into contact with. Plus, at the end of the day, the definition of chaos is really constant change. Zinch is also believed to be, by the mortals of the Warhammer world, incredibly knowledgeable. He knows all, including very valuable secret knowledge that many a mortal would give anything to know. And that is what many mortals do. They give up their souls for a glimpse of the knowledge Zinch possesses, becoming slaves to his every whim. And of course, the Liber Chaotica gives us fantastic insight on the changer of the ways. 
Both terrible and wondrous was he to behold. His eyes were twin hollows that burned with sapphire flame, and great wings rose from between his shoulder blades to stretch high above his head, their surface shimmering like mother of pearl. He stretched out his hand and bade me to follow him into the aether, and follow him I did, along paths that never were to a place that should not be. Far to the north he led me, to where the gates of end had stood open since before the rise of men. There I looked into the immortal realms and saw four great thrones within the endless plains of oblivion. I asked the messenger, whose thrones are these? And the messenger said, they are the thrones of the ancient powers, the spirits of fornication, wrath, despair and inconstancy. Both thrones and dominions are they, brother gods and princes of mortal hearts. From those thrones exuded a forgetfulness that drew unto itself the hearts and minds of all humanity, for in them were both the greatest strengths of men and the greatest follies. Dancing around those thrones, I saw every vision of cruelty, demons without mercy, whose countenance were filled with fury, with teeth protruding forth from their gaping mouths. Their eyes burned like the desert sun, and all the horrors of mankind leaked from between their narrow lips. Then I felt the thorns of despair puncture my heart, and fear caught at my breath. I begged him to take me away from that place of cruel gods and demon princes, and show to me instead the gateway to the land of wholesome gods. So much did I long for the comfort of familiar deities, but he just smiled, and in that smile I saw reflected all the malice, all the pity, and all the cruel humour of the world. He told me that there was no other gate except for that which stood before us, and he told me that there was only one realm beyond the gate. I stepped back from him then, for I believed that surely he spoke untrue, and I told him as such. If this is the only realm, I said, where then is Sulkan's palace, or the healing pools of Shalia, where are Tal's hunting grounds, and Manan's azure citadel? Where are the celestial temples of the gods of men? For before me I see only the thrones and dominions of chaos." And then he seemed to grow in size, so that his head eclipsed the pale sun, and his shimmering wings seemed to fill the vaults of the sky. There is only one gate, he said once more, and only one realm that lies beyond. It is true that the plains of darkness stand open before you, but also, and at that same time, the endless tears of light stretch up above you. Then he began to fade from view becoming transparent like mist upon the breeze. His parting words were like a subtle knife puncturing the bladder of my false hopes. Mortals see so much, but understand little. For as much as the divine, the divine moulds the mortal realms to fit its purpose, so too do the mortal realms mould the divine through their actions and aspirations. You look into the ether for proof of light or a fear of finding dark, yet the ether is neither light nor dark, except when mortals make it so. And then the messenger was gone. Heed my words, all that you, all you that read this, for I have looked into the abyss, and my eyes have been changed. All that was hidden is now revealed to me. I have seen all worlds and the secrets that scheming gods and lesser men would keep from us are now the bread and wine of my heart. No longer shall I labour under the shallow misconceptions of received wisdom. Truth shall be my companion from this day on, for the scales have been lifted from my eyes, and I have seen the hope of our salvation. At last I can be forgiven, for at last I can see that I have sinned. In this passage, which is written from the point of view of the mortal author, 
we have a clear example of the use of Zinch in the search of secret and divine knowledge and the toll that that takes on the human mind and soul. We are also given a brief description of the look of Zinch. However, one thing worth mentioning that stood out for me is that this passage definitely um, takes the position that all gods are from the realm of chaos, including the ones believed to be good. The last thing to mention about Zinch is the personal realm he rules within the realm of chaos. According to several sources, one famous feature is outside his fortress home, which is labelled the Impossible Fortress by the way, is a huge labyrinth made entirely of crystal that is believed to contain such a multitude of incredibly complex geometric patterns that it is impossible to solve and pass through to the centre. Yet, if someone were able to do so, they would find the hidden library, a library that contains all the knowledge and secrets of the universe. Finally, let's move on to the most powerful Chaos God in Warhammer lore. He's already come up several times in this video. The Blood God, the God of Murder, Karnath, Korn. Now, I've already given you an excerpt from the Liber Chaotica at the beginning of this video, which was about the birth of Korn. So now that he's been born, Let's talk about what Korn is like. So, like the other three main Chaos Gods, Korn has rule over certain mortal actions and emotions. These are things that relate to violent pain and death. So things like war and murder and physical abuse, and also emotions like hate and rage. In a world consumed by constant battle, all killing increases his power and influence. The more violent, the better. And so currently, Korn has more power and influence than any other god within the realm of chaos. Meaning he has the largest domain and the most demonic and mortal followers. However, to see Korn as purely a violent psychopath is to misunderstand him. Korn does respect martial honour. His favourite children are his worshippers that show great courage and skill on the battlefield, and he even shows respect for his enemies that show these qualities. Though it must be said that while respecting these enemies, he will still do everything in his power to kill them in the most violent way possible. I mentioned just earlier some of the names attributed to Korn. However, as he is the oldest of the four great Chaos Gods, he has actually accumulated thousands of different names. Some of them are Akhar, Kjorn, Korgar, the Axe Father, the Blood Father, the Blood Wolf, and the Wolf Father. Many of these names come from the northern human tribes, of which he has many different followers. So what does Korn look like? Well, he's most commonly depicted as a giant creature with the head of a wolf. He has blood red skin and is clad in armour the colour of brass. In his grasp is a huge battle axe and sometimes his other hand is depicted holding a long, coiling whip. He has two great big horns on his head, and finally, and most importantly, he is in a constant state of barely contained berserk fury, rage that at any moment could bubble up to the surface. Korn's realm is said to have rivers of blood and a throne that sits upon a huge mountain of skulls, as I talked about earlier in the video. Some more details are the throne atop the mountain is said to be made of brass, and the skulls are said to belong to anyone killed in the name of Korn, 
Which brings me on to an important point about the will of the blood god. Corn does not care where the blood comes from, as long as it flows. And so the most important job for a cornate follower is to kill as many living creatures as possible in order to add more skulls to the blood god's ever-growing mountain. When in battle with the forces of corn, you will almost certainly hear the famous chant, Blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne. So, that's the four main chaos gods. There are many more that I'm sure will come up in future videos as they become more relevant. One such example that springs to mind is the Horned Rat that will be explored in detail in a video about the Skaven. It should also be mentioned that while the Chaos Gods are often at war with each other over power and influence, there are certain rare times when all four will come together in common purpose. This is usually um, when backing a particularly powerful Chaos Champion in launching an assault upon the civilised races of the Warhammer world. These wars are known as Great Wars Against Chaos, and I'll talk about them in much greater detail when we reach those points in the lore. Let's wrap this video up, as it's getting pretty damn long. There are just so many aspects to chaos that it needs to be tackled in a few videos, or we'll be here all night. And I'm sure none of us really want that. So just where are we in this chaotic story? We know how the Realm of Chaos began, in a parallel dimension filled with a magical substance given the name Chaos Energy. We know how the Chaos Gods were birthed from this energy, as a result of the emotions of mortals. We know that there are many, many um, evil, in inverted commas, Chaos Gods within the Realm of Chaos, each one having its own personal realm and demonic minions. The size, strength and amount, depending on the Chaos God's power and influence. We also theorise that perhaps even the good, in inverted commas, gods, are actually as a result of chaos. We know how they gain power, and we have just talked about the four most powerful gods. We also know that thanks to those lovely omniscient creators, the old ones, that the wall, in inverted commas, that separates the two worlds now has a few holes knocked into it, allowing chaos energy and therefore the demons to access the physical world. Wow, <laughs> researching chaos really is chaotic, but I think I have a plan of where to go from here. In the next video, I'll talk about the many different kinds of demons, including some stories about particular famous demons. Uh, we'll also talk about the lives of the mortals who choose to follow chaos and their ultimate fates. The video after that, we can move on to the famous First Great War Against Chaos. I'll say no more now, but trust me, that topic is a good one. So, it's time for me to say goodbye. Anyone who follows my videos, I'm really sorry it's a little late out, but unfortunately, real life got in the way. I'm hoping to get videos out once a week from now on, so we should get through this a lot quicker. I'd like to wish everyone a very happy new year, filled with joy, and remember, if you liked this chaotic video, please remember to rate, comment, subscribe, you know, all that good stuff. Toodle pip!